So just for um, our sakes, so we make sure we get it right, name, all that stuff. I am Mary Beth Pfeiffer, author of Lyme, The First Epidemic of Climate Change. So this book that you have written um, is essentially an investigative journalist account of what we now know to be um, a crisis here in the United States, but we were saying really around the world. Mm -hmm. Talk to me first of all, how did you, uh, how, how did Lyme sort of come into your consciousness, your world, and why write a book about it? My understanding is you're an investigative journalist mm -hmm. that's tackled other areas. Mm -hmm. So how did you get to this one? Well, in 30 years as an investigative reporter, I covered a lot of different issues. And Lyme disease was sort of always on my radar, but I never really thought of it as an investigative series. Um, I didn't think there was a scandal associated with Lyme disease, so it took me a while to get to it. Um, but when I did start looking into Lyme disease, it was because I wanted to find out why we didn't have a vaccine for my dog or for my children or for my grandchildren. And what I found was in investigating this issue, in looking into the various problems, that there was a wealth of investigative fodder there for me. Uh, I found that tests didn't work many times. I found that treatments left many people ill. And basically the other reason that I looked into Lyme disease is because I live in and reported in an area of the world with among the highest rates of Lyme disease known, and that is the Hudson Valley. Um, of course, in the entire Northeast, in Connecticut, in the tri-state area, um, those rates um, also vie for being among the highest rates in the world. When we talk about, all right, had you known anybody that had Lyme? Uh, was there anybody in your immediate circle or even anybody in your family that had been infected? Mm -hmm. Or was this strictly just because you are living, as you said, in one of the areas with the highest rates of Lyme disease? Well, I do live in an area with a lot of Lyme disease, and yes, I had had Lyme disease, my husband had had Lyme disease. We were very familiar with the risk of ticks, but we were among the lucky ones. We saw the bite, we got the bullseye rash, and we were quickly treated. So that's really not why I began looking into Lyme disease, not because I was a chronic Lyme sufferer. I looked into it because it was so prevalent. You can't go anywhere in the Hudson Valley and start a conversation with someone about Lyme disease and not hear stories, and especially not hear stories of children who have missed months of schooling, of people who have been unable to work, people who can't get treatment for late stage advanced Lyme disease. So I did not go into this as a chronic Lyme sufferer. I went into it as an investigative journalist who really didn't have a preconceived view of Lyme disease. And I'm really the first person to take that hard look of Lyme disease, to look at the entire gamut of issues, and to really draw some conclusions about the problems that exist for this disease. When we looked into it, or as I should say, as we are looking into it, we have found that as we just scratch the surface, there are so many myths, there's so much information, there's so many misconceptions. I mean, it's mind-numbing yes. when you look at it. And, and I actually find that it's darn near impossible to look at the entire issue as a whole because there are, there are so many controversies and what works for one person is not what works for another and the symptoms that show up in one individual are completely different from another. You have medical professionals, budding heads, respected mm -hmm. voices who can't even agree on the basics. Yes. Did you find that in your reporting? Yes. At many points uh, in my journey, at many points in my journey through the Lyme disease issue, through the literature, through what's been published in the popular press, I felt totally overwhelmed because there's so many um, avenues that you can go down. And there's a lot of conflict and a lot of controversy. And I guess the first controversy I would point to, and the first myth as well, is that the tests work. It has been said over and over again in the medical literature and by the CDC and by the Infectious Diseases Society of America 
that doctors can and should rely on the two-tier Lyme disease test to diagnose this disease. But at the same time, it's acknowledged in many scientific studies that the test doesn't work at certain points in the disease. So early on, you're virtually guaranteed that you're not going to test positive. Later on, the test gets better, but it's still not fully reliable. So many people don't test positive who actually do have the disease, and that's when it becomes very dangerous. Among the other um, myths of Lyme disease are that a short course of antibiotics works. It eradicates the infection in the human body. Well, that is likely true for a majority of patients, that they do get well, that they go on with their lives, particularly if they are diagnosed early. But there is a share of people, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, these figures are in the scientific literature, who have persisting symptoms for months, sometimes years later. And so we, we have this situation where doctors are told, rely on a test, it works, rely on antibiotics, they work. But on the other hand, there is also evidence, and this is disclosed in the medical literature, that the tests fail for some people and that treatments fail for some people. And because Lyme disease has been framed as easy to diagnose, easy to treat, it has been a disease without urgency. We need to bring some urgency to Lyme disease because there is a share of people, and we're talking tens of thousands every year who don't get diagnosed, who don't get uh, well. So that is why we need to bring more attention, more funding, more urgency to Lyme disease. If you look at the numbers, if you look at what the CDC World Health Organization, NIH, on and on and on, really just the federal government, allocates to other worldwide crises like Zika. Yeah. The numbers are staggering. And not that Zika is not a worthwhile cause to, you know, a, a, um, a disease to eradicate. But when yes. you look at how many people are infected by Zika and how many people are affected chronically, especially by Lyme, yes. and then the funding for one versus the funding for another, it just simply doesn't make any sense. And it leads me to believe that something else is at play. Some, there's another stake in the game someplace that I'm not aware of or that most people aren't aware of. Well, I often say that if ticks could fly, as mosquitoes do, mm -hmm. this disease would get a lot more attention. Uh, you might recall that after the um, Zika virus emerged about the time of the 2016 um, uh, Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, there was enormous attention paid to Zika virus and to the fact that it was causing birth defects in, Microcephaly. in babies. Yeah. And this was a very, very serious outcome of this mosquito-borne illness. There was something like 2,500 cases of it in South America. Then Zika showed up on the shores of the U.S. We had it in southern Florida, and we had a few cases in Texas. These are cases that could be counted in the hundreds. And um, moreover, very few cases Moreover, very few cases involving that worst outcome of Zika, where you had babies who were born with deformities. Nonetheless, within months, the U.S. Congress allocated $1.1 billion to fight Zika, under the assumption that this was a serious threat to the United States, um, as well as um, doing our duty in terms of meeting the challenge of an emerging global infection. That's all well and good. We should behave that way. We should pay attention to the threat of Zika. But Lyme disease has never gotten that kind of attention. It has never gotten money measured in the billions, for sure, even in the hundreds of millions. And the reason for that goes back to the way Lyme disease has long been framed by mainstream medicine. It's been framed as relatively easy to diagnose and relatively easy to cure. There are exceptions, but those exceptions tend to get brushed aside. The exceptions are very important because we're talking many, many thousands of people who don't get well after they are infected. Yeah, a lot of physicians, it seems, almost treat it like the common cold. 
Like you'll get it in the summer, you'll be over it by the fall, you might have some nagging symptoms, but by and large you're gonna be just fine. Yeah. And then you have people, we profiled them in, our, in um, different reports that we've done, who you know are nine, 10 years old getting bitten and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're 13, 14 unable to walk. Yes. You know, and it takes them years in order to regain even use of their legs. Mm -hmm. And they're being told that they are making it up that it's all in their head that they have MS at the age of 10, yeah. 11. And yeah. I, I mean, then the stories yeah. are everywhere, it seems. Um, but you were saying also in your book, especially you chronicle that this is, again, not just in the United States. Mm -hmm. We see this all over the world. I mentioned to you, I heard from people in the Netherlands, yeah. in England, in Ireland, in Australia, Mm -hmm. where it's also being ignored there, which I think is particularly fascinating. It's not just mm -hmm. the United States that's ignoring it. Yeah. Countries around the world are turning a blind eye to this, what really has become an epidemic. Well, there is no doubt that Lyme is a global epidemic. Ticks are moving all over the place and they're being fostered by climate change. This epidemic is being abetted by a warming planet. So you see ticks moving north into Canada. You see them moving north into Scandinavia. They're spreading all over Russia and China. Lyme disease is a worldwide phenomenon. Beyond that, because of the influence of American medicine, which is highly respected around the world, the way that we treat Lyme disease in America is largely the way that Lyme disease is treated in other countries. Other countries rely on our research from our esteemed institutions to tell them how to treat this disease. So in the Netherlands, you have people, as in the United States, who suffer the ongoing symptoms of Lyme disease long after they've been treated, but yet they cannot get treatment beyond the short courses of antibiotics that are dictated in the medical literature. This happens in Germany, this happens in the UK. I, I went there and I interviewed people who had actually flown to California to get care for Lyme disease or had gone mm. to Belgium. Um, I talked to Swedes who went over to England to get care for Lyme disease. So this is a worldwide phenomenon and it's damaging and harmful to patients that they can't get care for these lingering symptoms of Lyme disease. What they can get is palliative care, care for their symptoms. Mm -hmm. They can get painkillers. Um, they can also get other diagnoses, and they often do. They're, they're diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. They're diagnosed with depression, with um, rheumatoid arthritis, with fibromyalgia, other things, anything but Lyme disease. And the reason for that is because our view, or the mainstream American view of Lyme disease, is that it doesn't persist. It doesn't um, survive in your body, the pathogen that is, after you're treated with antibiotics. So the, there, are, there are two schools of thought about Lyme disease, basically, as it presents after treatment. Either you continue to be infected with the Lyme disease pathogen, or perhaps you have some sort of autoimmune response to the pathogen, to the damage that has mm -hmm. been done in your body. And there is evidence to support both of those schools of thought. There is a lot of evidence emerging right now from universities like Northeastern, from Tulane, from uh, Johns Hopkins, which suggests that animals and test tube research involving the Lyme disease pathogen, um, in, particu in particular in animals, I want to start that over again. Mm -hmm. um, okay. There's a great deal of evidence emerging now that it's really difficult to kill the Lyme disease pathogen in both animals and in test tubes. We've done studies of monkeys and studies of mice We've infected them with Lyme disease. We've treated that, them in the same way that a human being is treated, namely with doxycycline, with frontline antibiotics. And scientists have gone back and found, lo and behold, a share of spirochetes, a share of the Lyme disease pathogen, survives in, in animals. It also survives in test tubes. So we have growing evidence that suggests 
Maybe that's what's going on with people who remain ill. They have Lyme disease persisters, they're called, in their body. They have ongoing infection. There's also evidence, less evidence I would say, that there, um, there's less evidence that people have an autoimmune response to the having been infected with Lyme disease. That some sort of inflammation um, kicks off this response and causes ongoing symptoms, ongoing pain, and so forth. Um, the bottom line is we need to do more research on both of those aspects of Lyme disease. And we haven't done the work, we haven't spent the money on Lyme disease. There's a lot more we need to do. And I feel like there's a growing recognition of this problem. The media is paying a lot more attention to it. This emerging science is suggesting we don't have the answers on Lyme disease. And I do see more um, papers coming out on potential new tests for Lyme disease, on treatments for Lyme disease. So I'm encouraged. I think we're on the right track. I think we've reached a tipping point on Lyme disease that says we don't have this disease figured out and we need to go back to the drawing board on it. But on the flip side, this is not a new disease. I mean, in the United States, uh, it was found in Lyme, Connecticut, was it 1972, 73, I in think? In the 70s, it emerged in Lyme, Connecticut. Right. And in your book, my understanding is you chronicle that it's been around for much, much longer than that. Yes. yes. Uh, so what is frustrating, I think, to a lot of Lyme sufferers is that it's not new and yet people are treating it as if it might be. You said there's growing research that suggests that maybe more people are starting to pay attention to it. Yes. But it's been around for so long. So I, I suppose the, the, the overarching question is, well, what's the holdup? But you mentioned, and it's in the title of your book, climate change. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious why, and maybe you've addressed this, but why aren't climate change advocates and climate change groups pushing for greater research and awareness mm -hmm. of you know the rising temperatures around the world. Why aren't they latching onto this? Yes. Why is there no synergy there? That's a good question, Teresa. I wrote the book from the perspective of climate change for a couple of reasons. First of all, climate change is global. Lyme disease is global. Ticks are moving far and wide. They're being carried by migrating birds to places where migrating birds have long brought them, but now when the birds drop the ticks, the ticks survive. They breed, they make more ticks, and they bring Lyme disease to new places. And this is happening, by and large, because of climate change. The world is warmer. There are other changes that ha have contributed to the spread of Lyme disease and the growth of Lyme disease. Basically, we live in an adulterated world. We live in a world of forest fragments where nature is not quite in its natural state. We don't have you know, one species keeping another species under control. We have a lack of balance. For example, mice play a huge role in Lyme disease. We've got lots of mice these days in these small forest fragments that they love. Um, and we don't have foxes who normally would have kept those mice under control. So we have a warmer planet, we have an unbalanced planet. And I, I took the point of view of climate change as a starting point for my book because Lyme disease is global, because it's spreading, because we did this. We caused this problem. We didn't create it, but we have abetted it. We have created a situation where Lyme disease and ticks can thrive. And I hoped by focusing on climate change to create awareness that humanity has a real role and responsibility in this whole scenario, and to bring in people who don't know the threat of ticks, who don't know the damage they can do. There's a huge constituency of people around the world, around the United States, there are hundreds of Lyme disease support groups, if not thousands. These folks know the threat of ticks. They know, know the damage that can be done by ticks. 
What I want to do is alert that other unschooled population out there who has a vague awareness that ticks and Lyme disease are there, but don't really know our role in creating this and don't really know the damage it can do. So I have two questions for you on this, but first, no, you knowing the damage um, that this has caused, the further damage that will come down the road if we don't reverse course in any way, has your research led you to any sort of definitive conclusions as to what can be done to kind of roll it back? Uh, so to <laughs> sort of bring things at least, not back to the starting point, but just sort of try to reverse time a little bit, yeah. um, especially for those who are suffering. Did you come to any sort of conclusions? We talked about the fact that Lyme disease has been around for decades, and yet we've made very little progress. We're using the same test that we've been using to diagnose Lyme disease since 1995. No other test, no other test has come along to take its place, largely because the powers that be in mainstream medicine, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, has for many years defended that test. We know the test is flawed. So the first thing that needs to happen to change this situation is to recognize that there's a problem. And I think that's happening. There are um, tests that are in development now. Just um, this month, the FDA fast-tracked a new test for Lyme disease. They declared it a breakthrough technology. That is a very big development. I was really glad to see that happen. But other things need to be put into place, you know, beyond recognition, beyond saying, okay, we have a problem. We need to spend some more money. I often compare Lyme disease to AIDS. A Both, lot of people do, and autism, <laughs> but yes. Yes, um, but the AIDS pathogen and the Lyme disease pathogen, the two bugs, were identified within two years of each other in the early 1980s. It took a few years for the AIDS epidemic to really um, get to a point where Congress and government and society in general paid a lot of attention. But when it happened, huge amounts of money were poured into AIDS. We bu built laboratories. We set up new um, PhD programs so we'd have the scientists to do the work. We set up um, laboratories with um, reagents where, um, I'm gonna go back on that. We did the work. We set up an infrastructure to attack the problem of AIDS. That never happened for Lyme disease. And it didn't happen for Lyme disease for a couple of reasons. First of all, of course, you didn't have people dropping dead from Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a much slower, more insidious kind of disease for the people who aren't cured initially. So there wasn't that, that uh, impetus to really get going on Lyme disease. But beyond that, we also framed Lyme disease as easy to diagnose and easy to treat. So the money wasn't, wasn't spent, the laboratories weren't set up, the PhD programs weren't um, established, and Lyme disease sort of took its place as a really second tier kind of disease. And it's not. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely not, especially when you talk about the underreporting of it. Yes. Um, the number of, what we know is, is horrific and tragic, and it's, it pales in comparison to what's mm -hmm. really happening. But I mentioned this to you earlier. I have always been under the impression that something else was at play when it came to this skewed response. And my own research, I, I don't know if it's big pharma um, that has somehow uh, developed this test or there seems to me that there is another power at play that is actively preventing mm -hmm. a, the global awareness or the global response. Uh -huh. Did your research lead you to anything on that behalf? Um, because, you, because you started with the premise of why is there no vaccine yes. for my dog or my grandchildren? Yeah. And there would be if Big Pharma mm -hmm. or the greatest medical minds yeah. We're behind this. Yeah. There absolutely would be. Just as there just as you suggested, there's the right medication 
for HIV and AIDS, mm -hmm. for cancer, for MS, right. for these all these other for all these other illnesses that are just as devastating to the body, be it in their own time frame, there are mm -hmm. appropriate drugs to at least combat it. Yes. And and diagnostic tests. And this just doesn't happen. No. Well, on that I would say for a great many years. Lyme disease has been controlled by a very small, relatively, number of people. People with access to the highest powers in the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. People who are connected to the New England Journal of Medicine. Pe people who can get their research funded by the National Institutes of Health and can get published in major medical journals. It's a relatively small number of people. It's mainly the Infectious Diseases Society of America and the authors of the Lyme disease guidelines that they first put out in 2001. And because of those very tight bonds between this medical society, between people in government, no other idea has been able to break through about Lyme disease. They have controlled the debate, the discussion, the funding, the treatment, the testing. And yet, we know that 10 to 20 percent of people who are treated for Lyme disease stay ill for months, perhaps years after treatment. Now every year, that amounts to 30 to 60,000 people given that we know about 300,000 people are affected yearly with Lyme disease. So to go back to your original question, why haven't we seen change in this dynamic, in this landscape of Lyme disease? I believe that the people who have controlled this disease for a long time believe in their research. They have come to certain conclusions based on their own observations, based on their tracking of cases of patients, based on their laboratory findings. And that's all well and good. It's legitimate research. But there's another set of research. There's another view of Lyme disease. There's evidence, there's science that shows the Lyme disease pathogen can survive. Mm -hmm. Is that what's causing the problem? We have to draw more definitive conclusions. But there's science showing that the test doesn't work. There's science pointing in another direction. We need to follow that other direction through. We have to give that side as much attention as we've given the mainstream side that has ruled this disease for many years. Are you concerned that by putting two very controver controversial issues together, Lyme and climate change, not only on the same book jacket, <laughs> but really in the same sentence, yes. uh, that that automatically is going to turn people off from your research or your theories. People mm -hmm. have enough issues with Lyme, and they have a heck of a lot of issues with climate change, yeah. questioning whether or not it's real and the like, and that's a global issue as well. So are you concerned that by putting these two things together, despite the fact that they, as you said, are intrinsically linked, that people automatically might turn off your theory? I have faith that people understand that we've adulterated the world, that the world is warmer. You just have to look at the statistics for the last 10 years, and I think eight out of 10 have been the, the hottest years on record. I don't pretend to be an expert on climate change itself. I'm not saying that, that climate change is something that we can't undo. Let me, let me rephrase that. I think I'll just stick with. I got you caught in a pickle here. <laughs> you did, because yeah. uh, if I say that climate change didn't cause this. Right. And, and I, I understand that, and that's, that, that's the, I that guess the, warming, the basis of I my question. But warming, okay, I, I think that's I the, can say. That's the basis of my question, too. Warming is abetting this. There's no doubt about that. We know the planet is warming. 
I don't point fingers as to whether jet, jets flying overhead or um, power plants and so forth have actually caused that warming. I really don't discuss that in the book. Um, I do discuss the ways in which we've adulterated the world. I do accept that climate change is real. And I give credit to people out there for understanding that the world is warming, that it has had certain effects on the planet. And the movement of ticks is one of those effects. Um, but I, you know, I'm not an expert in climate change as to what is causing climate change, but there's little doubt that climate change is abetting the movement of ticks. For those who haven't yet picked up your book, for those who probably don't know much about Lyme disease or the connection between Lyme and climate change, what do you hope they walk away with? What, did, what, what do you hope, what, what, what is your hope for their one takeaway from your research, from your investigation? Um, you're not somebody who's new to journalism mm -hmm. nor investigations mm -hmm. of any kind. But this is such a unique one. Yeah. So, so what do you hope after they read this, they walk away with? I want my readers to, to learn that we have a serious problem with tick-borne illness. We have ticks in uh, our parks, even in urban parks. In many of the places we go outdoors, there are ticks. And they don't only carry Lyme disease, they carry other diseases as well. Even if we had a vaccine against Lyme disease, we'd still have the problem of Babesia in ticks, which causes a malaria-like illness, very serious. We have other illnesses that are being identified and are showing up with greater frequency. Powassan virus, uh, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis. The belly of a tick is often filled with a lot of nasty things, only half of which we probably understand and know about. So I want people to understand that there are risks out there, that nature has been changed in ways that have made it dangerous for us and for our children. I want people to protect their kids against ticks. I want them to check for ticks when kids come inside from playing outside. I want them to take precautions. I want people to understand that we have a problem with Lyme disease and we need to do something about it. I think that's a good place to stop. Is there any, um, anything else that you'd like to add from your reporting uh, and certainly from the book mm -hmm. that you think is important for people to know? Uh, maybe it's in the book, maybe it's not, yeah. but when it comes to the issue of especially Lyme and climate change mm -hmm. connected. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are ways that we can protect ourselves. Permethrin impregnated clothing is one way. Um, Talk to me a little bit about that. And you yeah. also that was used on military bases? Yes. Um, the military, for many years, has been using a substance called permethrin. It's a synthetic derivative of something in chrysanthemum flowers. Ticks hate it. It kills ticks. And they basically impregnate the um, fatigues of soldiers with this substance, which doesn't wash out, by the way. It can, a, a, a pair of pants can be washed many, many times um, if it's impregnated with permethrin, and it will remain effective. It basically repels and sometimes often kills the ticks that, that are unfortunate enough to land on the clothing that's been impregnated with permethrin. We can use this ourselves, we can buy it over the counter, we can spray our clothing, our shoes, our socks. Studies have shown that people who, who use permethrin impregnated clothing, socks, shoes, have a far lower risk of being bitten by ticks. And the military has used it around the world at many bases because the U.S. military has a serious problem with Lyme disease. It's been found on 120 bases around the world, from West Point to Germany to Korea. Um, we ha have problems with Lyme disease and ticks. And you know, you have a soldier who's crawling through um, brush on a field kind of mission. Um, that soldier needs protecting, just as our children who are playing outside and who should be encouraged to play outside um, need protecting. 
So that's one thing I do recommend. Um, I believe it's safe. I've, I've read um, the research on permethrin, which has been used, as I said, for years in the military. Um, we also need to take other measures to protect ourselves. When we're walking um, a path um, through a field, stay in the middle of the path. Don't brush up against the high grasses or weeds because you may come into contact with ticks. The ticks that deliver Lyme disease, they don't walk this way, they walk that way. Up a blade of grass or a bit of brush and they just basically hang out and they wait for a mammal to pass by. And from 50 feet, they can smell the, di the carbon dioxide that you exhale. And when they detect that carbon dioxide, out go the legs and they're hoping to latch on. Hmm. That's very interesting. And I have, <laughs> in all of our research, I have never heard anybody tell me that or explain it that way. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, at the end of the day, I mean, you know probably more about Lyme than you ever mm -hmm. thought you would. Mm -hmm. Or maybe than you ever really wanted to know. Yeah. Was this yeah. sort of a rabbit hole for you in a lot of ways? Um, it was. Um, it was sort of an onion to be peeled, and it just, there were layers upon layers upon layers. And um, there are treatment um, problems, of course. Um, do, do antibiotics work? Do we give them uh, in long enough doses? Um, are there other um, alternatives? Um, to treating Lyme disease. There are many, many things out there that people are trying with some success, but they get very little guidance from mainstream mm -hmm. medicine because these other alternative treatments haven't been tested scientifically for the most part because we haven't accepted that antibiotics aren't always curative.